Shooting interview style productions is the bread and butter of any cinematographer or videographer. Knowing how to shoot a clean, nicely lit talking head will advance you in your cinematography career more than you can imagine. I know you have a lot of questions in your mind. Where do I put my lights? Where do I place my camera? What do I need to know? We've made so many mistakes along the way, but I think we finally found a system that works for us. And now I'm here to pass it on to you. Before we even talk about this project, the first thing I want to look at is what makes a good interview, and especially one that is on a backdrop. The main problem that arises when shooting an interview on a backdrop is that it can feel flat or boring. There are many ways to combat this by building depth in your image with the use of shaping light as well as production design when applicable. Generally, you would set up an interview with two cameras, the first being a master wide that generally framed in the center or in the thirds. I've seen this done in many interviews and this is very dependent on the subject matter as well as the directing style. The second angle would be a tighter angle and this would be on the left or right side depending where you're keying from. And the way that cinematographers develop depth in these images is by shaping light. The first is using a very large key source to give a soft look to the talent to complement their skin. This is usually done with a large soft box angled 45 degrees to the talent and backed off a decent distance to wrap the light around the face. The second would be to add or remove contrast to the talent's face with the uses of a fill light, negative fill, or a bounce board. And how you choose that is dependent on the look you're going for. If you're going for something that is dramatic for a docu-style, you would definitely use a negative fill. But if it's more airy and comedic, a bounce or fill light would be used. And sometimes you might not need either of them or want to do the opposite as the filming environment provides enough ambient light. To separate your talent even more, the best practice is to add a hair light. And this is usually that small sliver of highlights you can see in the talent's hair or shoulders. And this adds separation from the background. This could be a soft or hard source. This is really dependent again on your subject matter. But when I like to use hair lights, I always use a soft source. Placing your hair light is a tricky thing to navigate as well. But the main thing I like to do is place it to the opposite side of my key light. So I create a checkboard of light and dark sections across my talent's face. There are many scenarios where the hair light could be in a different spot, but this is all dependent on the look you're going for and looking to achieve. And the last thing that we can add in terms of lighting is the interest into the backdrop by shooting some light into it. This could be in the form of splash of light on the backdrop itself, as well as having just the backdrop that has a texture already to it. This could be in the form of a slash of light, gradient of color, shapes of light, and the list can go on and on. And another way is to do the actual opposite with your background and light it evenly, so it appears unnatural. This is done in this example I am about to break down, but I have also seen it in a lot of commercial style interviews. Another alternative way of adding depth to your frame is the use of production design. This could be in the form of a nice couch to sit on, a table in front of them, or a side table with a lamp or flower. Now that we know all the fundamental concepts of what makes a good interview setup, we're gonna go over a breakdown for a Mother's Day campaign that we shot and directed. And this is the Mother's Day campaign that we're gonna be looking at. So what I've been seeing with a lot of content in terms of these interviews is that a lot of people go for this BTS style approach in terms of showing the slate as well as showing the set and then doing a wide of the whole scene as well as these details. This was the creative that was sold for this project in terms of showcasing, oh, we're bringing our moms in to interview them to see what they know about the advertising industry. And I feel like that this is very appropriate in terms of what advertising about, what is commercials are made about, as well as the different forms of media that involve advertising. So there's no really curtain to unveil here or any things that we're trying to hide. This was the entire set and we're gonna break it down as we go, but this was a two camera setup and this was shot on the red Komodo with size lenses. I forgot the exact models of them, but there are photo lenses, so something very common. As you can see here, this is a very simple setup that could be run by a minimal crew. Honestly, to do this properly, you would need three people. Obviously, everybody's gonna be having multiple roles. And for the specific roles, it'd be a person on A-cam, another person on B-cam, and then an audio person, and then the person on A-cam could be directing and pulling focus and vice versa. This is gonna play a very important role later that we're in a studio with white walls. So we're shooting into the psych of this studio. So a psych wall is a, basically a wall that connects smoothly from the floor to the wall and also comes around. It's like a three corner wall with a very smooth transitions between the two. And then again, this is a very big thing that people are playing up in terms of using the slate in the shot. And I think it's really cool too. And it brings the viewer in to the action and what we're actually trying to sell. So one thing that I will point out too in terms of composition wise and making this not feel flat 
flat. A big thing that we did was using this table here. Because we're cutting to multiple people back to back to back and there's no necessarily B roll. And even for the edit, we only use the A roll. We had the B camera just set there just in case. They only asked for one camera, but this is something I always like to do because there's that one person that might in the edit ask for, oh, do we have another angle? So this is just something I like to do to cover myself. And here in terms of building depth and just the composition, we have a table. And then if we go back to the beginning, you could see that we had to stretch this cloth over the table to give it more of a nice matte surface because it was a high gloss table and it wasn't really giving us the look we're going for. And then also you can notice that the table is also on Apple boxes as well as the chair, just to give more height to what we were shooting. And you can see that texture of the table here. And then if you look actually in between cuts, what I did in the edit is line the table up to stay consistent. We had to readjust for every person that walked in and to keep a consistent thing across this edit in terms of always cutting to the same camera, something has to stay the same. Obviously the backdrop, but the table helps sell that a lot as well. And that's basically the whole project in terms of just them talking and then them delivering the lines. Like I said before, when it comes to the lighting, it is all about your subject matter. This is supposed to be lighthearted. We're talking and interviewing with moms and this is supposed to feel comedic almost. So this is supposed to be just a very high key setup in terms of not a lot of contrast. We're dealing with a nice background that's lit evenly, as well as just a low contrast ratio when you look at the face itself. If you're enjoying this breakdown, we're giving away a free PDF packed with lighting techniques for beginner cinematographers. Click the link in the description to find out more. Now back to the breakdown. And like I said before, when I'm ever doing these interview styles, I like to use a large soft source and a good so source to do that is a technique called book lighting. So I'm going to make this a top view and this is going to be called a book light. And what a book light is, is basically using a technique of bounce light and making it more directional. So I'm going to start off with my diffusion frame and then this is going to be a white solid and on my diffusion frame, I have one stop plus a grid and what that grid does is it directs it even more and stops the spill from going everywhere from that one stop of diffusion. And then in here I have a Forza 500 and this is aimed at the board and this bounces back into that and into my diffusion frame. And then this is my book light source. And the reason why we call it a book light is because this looks like the opening of a book. And then now what we noticed before that we're shooting in a big studio. So in that studio, uh, we're dealing with a bunch of white walls. So what will happen in this case, if I just left my book light open, I would have all that light spilling out here and bouncing everywhere and not necessarily going in the direction I want. So I have to shape this even more. Luckily in the studios, there is these things called V flats. And they're big, massive, like eight by eight pieces of cardboard that you can, you know, they have a black side and a white side. And now that is, I have a white side in here. So that is taking some of the bounce light that is here and directing it right back in my diffusion frame. So what we're doing is basically making a giant soft box. And this just gives you that big soft look that we're going for. But the problem is now that I'm shooting through this massive soft box, I have to control this even more. So this is going to be a front view of my source. So this is my giant six by four frame. So what I noticed here at this point was there's a lot of light everywhere on the table. It was looking really good on my talent, but it was very distracting on the table. So what you do is add flags to this. And then I just use another fee flat folded in half and we leaned it against here. And then we had the white side facing our talent. So this was acting like a, like a mini bounce, but like taking out all the light output from that bottom section of this grid. And you can see it in the BTS here. This is that grid that we're talking about in terms of what's on our fast frame and then the flag or cutter, whatever you want to call it. It was just a V flat, which is a white solid and the white solid is acting as a bounce now, but cutting out all the output on the bottom. And whenever you look at these interviews and you're wondering if they use a massive soft source, the one thing that I see is the catch light. If you look in their eyes there, you can see that nice twinkle and that nice little specular highlight that going in their eye. And that's due to a massive source. And that's very appealing when we talk about creating a nice interview. Now, 
like I said before, when we're looking at something that is more commercial on worldly, we would probably add a bounce to the left side of the face. But because this was wrapping around so much, I wanted to add some contrast back into the face by using negative fill. And then again, this is just due to the environment because I'm using this big soft box on the right here and there's a bunch of light that is actually bouncing up into the ceiling. I have enough ambient tone that I can actually add a negative fill. And this is usually my preferred method. I don't really like the bounce look. I really like the contrasty look when it comes to my shadow side. So this is that negative fill that we're talking here. And then you can see some of that shadow on this table, especially here and on the left side of frame and especially in our arms and bringing that contrast back into the uh, right side of our talent's face, which is camera left. Bam. Right. So now I have my contrast ratio set up in terms of my face. So if I were to draw an arrow going from this side to this side, I have a nice light to dark gradient that is very appealing and very not too moody and also not too flat when we look at shape. But now we're gonna be talking about putting in a hair light. Whenever I like to add a hair light, I like to use a Titan tube or anything that I could control the spill on and make it really directly. On this Titan tube, I have a crate and then this is set to the same color temperature of the source so we're not we don't have to mix here this is pretty standard when it comes to these things that you said to daylight and you don't really want to mix color temperatures here because it's going to be a little too distracting and maybe too artsy so this hair light you can see is this highlight that is on the top of her head here as well as the top of her shoulder and it basically comes across all the way here so again when i look at this image i am looking at a checkerboard especially when we go to her face if i were to draw this checkerboard i have some light on the left side of her face which is camera right and then we go into the shadow and then now how do we bring that light back into that checkerboard that we're looking for and that's with that hair light that we have here and then to even look at that hair light and see what that looks like i believe it's the first shot no sorry i believe it's this shot right here and that's that hair lights boomed over and like i said i like to place my hair light opposite to my key light so i have that sandwich and light and dark what we're talking about here and now we're back at our image and then you saw that there was another light that was off to the left side here and this was another Titan tube and it had a crate on it. And this was 5600 as well, all matching color temperatures across the board. And this is giving some levels back to this side of the backdrop. I like to keep everything relatively even and relatively clean. But if we were to draw an arrow that goes across this whole backdrop, you can see on this side, it's a lot lighter. And then on the other side, it's a bit dark. This is just one of the forms of adding interest back into your frame in terms of having something that doesn't necessarily look like a green screen but is obviously a backdrop that's placed there that has some interest across the frame when it comes to these things i like to splash light in the background and create that gradient and then i noticed that there was too much of a gradient so i kind of popped that up with this titan tube that's over here and when we look at this there's not a lot of lights that are being used and the main thing that we're doing is using the available light that's in the room and shaping it the whole play on this is playing up on the massive soft box that we we're using. And when it comes to production design, the production design is actually acting as a shaping light source as well. The light that is spilling onto the table, even though it's cut off from the bottom of our soft box, this is actually acting like a bounce. It doesn't matter where the light is coming from. If you put a light solid or a black solid in any position, it's going to reflect or absorb that light is that is in this area. What this white solid here is acting as a bounce back up into to fill the shadows that are in the back of the neck as well as here. So this is done in a lot of beauty campaigns and things like that to get a flat look across his face to make skin look as beautiful and as complimented as possible. And this was just something that was very subtle that helped us a lot too. Like I said, the table was made there for edit consistency as well to add some depth, but it also acts as a bounce source as well, which we're very fortunate about. And this is the B cam of the edit. I just want to showcase, even though it wasn't used in the edit, what this looked like in terms of what you can expect. This was shot on a 85. And as you can see here, this is a better in terms of dimensional image. 
because we're working with a lot more in terms of compression as well as the, everything that we're looking at. Obviously lights didn't move because this is the same setup, but we're just gonna look at in terms of what makes this so interesting. So we have a big soft source, as you can see by that catch light there. And then we angled her off a little bit because we could see that soft source in terms of the reflection in her glasses. So sometimes when she moves, you can see it a little bit. But again, we have a nice little triangle here of light, which gives us that Rembrandt lighting. Nice highlights on her left side of the face, otherwise known as camera right. And then a nice gradient in terms of shadows that are coming down here and then the shadows on her nose, as well as this part of her face. And then we bring that highlight back. It helps that her hair is actually white with, you can especially see it here, and then on the side of her shoulder with that hair light. So when we look at this in terms of what makes a cinematic image, we are again looking at those light and dark parts that we're constantly going back and forth without too much change or drasticness in terms of looking at what our subject matter is. This is an interview that's supposed to be happy, airy, and almost commercial-like. Now, we just went over a lot of lighting and cinematography techniques in a controlled environment. A question you might be asking yourself at this point may be, how do I apply these concepts to any environment? If you want to answer to that question, I have a video linked up here that you'll probably enjoy. Thanks for watching, subscribe for more, and I'll see you in the next video.